my friend Greg Phillipson, who I've known since the middle eighties when we worked at Business Land together. Greg was a recent um, speaker for us too on Arthur Schick at the, towards the beginning of the pandemic. And tonight he's going to um, talk about Dr. Seuss. And I, I guess I have to add that Greg, Greg used uh, Yiddish um, very liberally around our office. So I learned a lot of my Yiddish vocabulary from him. So Greg, go ahead and tell us about Dr. Seuss. Okay, well, actually, Spike, first of all, it's nice to see everybody. I'd like to introduce my uh, lovely Aunt Phyllis Phillipson from Florida, who's joining us this evening. It's my dad, Abba Shalom, his youngest sister. And um, I'm delighted to be back with all of you. I thought maybe before we start, um, let me see, Spike, I need to uh, be able to uh, screen share here. Yeah, sorry, please. I need to make you a co-host, sorry. Yeah, no problem, no problem at all, everybody's good. Uh, kind of a little bit late, Chag Sameach to everyone. Thank you. And I wanted to just, you might remember for those of you that were, um, uh, saw my Seuss, my Schick presentation, this is, uh, I thought maybe we could just stay on the Purim theme before we go into Dr. Seuss for a second. This is uh, a scene, for one of the illustrations Arthur Schick did in his 1925 Paris version of the Megillah Esther. And you can see here uh, Mordechai, Achishveros, and Esther. And you'll notice uh, Haman, um, and you can still use your groggers if you want to, uh, hanging in the back uh, um, in the tree there, not very prominent in this particular gorgeous uh, medieval manuscript type uh, artwork. And I guess if we look at, uh, let me see if I can get the other one up here. Um, I might have to screen share. Let's see, it's been paused. There's a comparison from 1925 and notice what the Holocaust did to not only his style. I mean, he lost that beautiful medieval manuscript type style. But it's a very, very interesting photo where he's inserted himself. That's a, a self-portrait of him holding a hamantaschen in his hand. And the new figure of Haman is prominent right in the front on the gallows. And notice the swastikas all over Haman, making that direct comparison to um, a, a Holocaust, if you will, avoided in, in, in the earlier version and uh, how prominent it is uh, in that particular one. So I just wanted to show you that um, just as a comparison for um, um, just for Purim. So uh, a little bit late, Hag Sameach to all of you. And we're going to start sharing the screen again. And I'm going to go to this. And how about, can we see this now? Yes, we can see it. All right, so we're going to talk about Dr. Seuss tonight. Dr. Seuss was born in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1904, lived a pretty long life. And I mentioned here that he was a Boy Scout, but we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. It, it was kind of an important thing in his life and uh, how it directed him in, in several areas. He graduated from Dartmouth College. And uh, just so you know, he, um, he and his second wife were the biggest benefactors to Dartmouth College in their history. And a few years ago, the, the, um, the medical school there is now the Seuss Medical School, the Dr. Seuss Medical School. A huge amount of money poured into that uh, college. After college, he went to Oxford University and uh, he got kind of bored and started traveling around Europe and never went back to school. And uh, the only good thing that happened at Oxford, I think, was that he met his wife, his first wife, Helen, there. So, uh, uh, and, and at Oxford, uh, people, his mother always wanted him to be a doctor. I don't know if you know this about him, but that's where the name Dr. Seuss comes from. He never was a doctor, so he took that pen name, and Seuss is his mother's maiden name. He was a famous cartoonist well prior to his children's books. We're, we're going to talk about Dr. Seuss up until the time of when he started doing most of his kids' books, The Cat in the Hat and, and other uh, publications. He was a cartoonist for, cartoonist for magazines like Vanity Fair, Life, Judge, and during World War II, much like Arthur Schick, he did a lot of political cartoons for a New York liberal paper called PM Daily. He worked for many years for Standard Oil and Esso, 
we're, we're going to look at uh, look at a lot of that material. And during the war, uh, he was assigned to uh, the special services area and was an art and animator uh, for the U.S. Army. He did uh, a film called Your Job in Germany, and we're going to talk specifically about these. Uh, was a screenwriter for Design for Death that won a 1947 Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. And if you've ever heard of Private Snafu, I know there's some military guys in here that knows what Snafu is. And uh, it's situation, normal, all, and uh, we're going to use Fouled Up to keep everything nice and uh, nice and clean here for Shabbos. But that's a picture of uh, Dr. Seuss on the left. Theodore Geisel as a major in the United States Army, and a little image of him, uh, kind of a painted image, a portrait of him in his uh, little bit later years. So let's take a look at this cover of Judge Magazine. This cover was called um, After Dark in the Park, the one on the right. And you'll notice the fish and uh, the turtles and the uh, kind of uh, antelope sort of creatures and the birds. You'll see these uh, images recurring over and over again throughout his career. When you see, think of, uh, you know, bluefish, yellowfish, whatever those fish were in, in order, uh, Yertle the turtle, and a variety of other things. On the left is what was inside this Judge magazine. And you'll notice already he's even making jokes. It's, uh, I can't even pronounce it, Dr. Theoropodus Seuss. And uh, his illustrations are kind of fun, and, but uh, candidly a bit primitive on the uh, illustration on the left. And these are from the 1930s, by the way. And it's a famous, famous, we have most of the things you see here today are all part of our uh, collection and archive. So here's a 1930s Life magazine. And look at how beautiful the mother um, um, gorilla and, the, and the, uh, the exotic bird. It's just a beautiful, beautiful illustration. Um, that he did. You see the NRA, uh, National Recovery Act, not the Rifle Association one in the bottom right hand corner, uh, helps to date the magazine. And you see him signing that early on as Dr. Seuss. And I'm sure he was paid significant money for these cover illustrations. So during this same time, what did he do? Uh, all sorts of commercial art. I mean, these guys had to make a living. And this Thomas Murphy company um, they made calendars, all sorts of calendars in the 1930s, uh, probably the 20s and beyond. And I was able, very able to win, uh, lucky to win an auction. These are original proofs that were used in this particular calendar. And you see the illustration of the um, antelope or elk uh, with the birds on top, the lovebirds. Um, that is one of the pages from the calendar. That, that's the color illustration. The blue ones on, on the left-hand side are proofs. And you can see how cute they are and how much people would have loved uh, opening a calendar and finding those wonderful illustrations. Notice on the bottom, a little bit on the right, uh, pardon me, on the left-hand side image, on the right, you see a kid on stilts. And again, all these recurring images, much like, Dr., uh, like Arthur Schick did in much of his artwork. I love this from the New York Woman Magazine. Um, also in the 1930s, this is Maternity Marches On. And uh, it's really, really cute. It's, it's advertising the Columbia Medical Center. And notice the, you know, the big, huge city and medical center in the background, the modern one. And up front, again, that little elk antelope uh, on, the, on the bottom right-hand corner. But it's so cute. The waiting room is the waiting tent. And that little flag over the delivery room shows a stork bringing out a little, um, a little um, Native American baby with feathers on. So it's really adorable. Of course, you see the triplets coming out. This was the kind of work he was doing early in his career. Now, this is really, a, we have two different um, original uh, cut from newspapers of this Hijay comic. This ran in the 1930s. I can't remember if it was 35 or 36. This ran for literally three months. It wasn't well received for some reason. And we have two of these um, from the Sunday funny section of a particular newspaper. And it's cute. It's kind of got like a, uh, you know, an Arabian night sort of theme to it. 
And uh, it, it, uh, it's, a, it's a lovely illustrated cartoon that just for some reason didn't catch on with the uh, American uh, public that was reading the funny papers. Now, many of you probably don't know that he also was in the beer business, uh, more from an illustrator. His grandfather, um, that will come into play here uh, when we talk about his Boy Scouts, um, his grandfather was actually a brewer uh, in Massachusetts. He was from Germany, as, as his name, Seuss, uh, indicates. And uh, this was the kind of work he did for Schaefer, Bach beer. He had that goat. It was a very, very successful advertising campaign. And for Narragansett Ale out of Rhode Island, um, you can see the, uh, uh, this is a beer tray from our collection and beer coasters are pretty hard to find. There's a few of the beer trays floating around on eBay. They're a little pricey, but uh, fortunately it, this is Chief Gansett, uh, obviously a play on the name of the uh, brewery and uh, just fun, fun kind of stuff that he did. Very colorful, exciting stuff. Now, when he got into a little bit later in the 30s, he started working for Standard Oil, for SO Oil. And they created the Seuss Navy. And this had broad-based appeal, not only with the um, SO Marine and SO Oil products, lubrication products, but at gas stations for consumers as well, not only with their dealers. So you see the glass on the left, that would have been a premium. There's, I have several different ones. Some are uh, more difficult to find than others. But it says the Seuss Navy. And if you had pulled in to fill up, maybe every time you got a different glass and collected the set. The little pin or button on the top center there even says SO oil on the back on the little paper inside the back of the pin. The Secrets of the Deep. I have volume one and volume two. I like the illustration on this one better. But these were for SO Marine product dealers, and they did a lot of advertising. The ashtray is very hard to find, and you can see the little seal, the Sioux seal, it's called the, uh, the uh, nuzzle pus, has a little admiral's hat on. I don't know if you can notice that with the little like one star on there. And that's an ashtray that would have been given out probably at dealer meetings and that sort of thing. They're, they're pretty tough to find. So if you were some sort of special person with an SO, maybe you were the top dealer for a particular period or did something special, they would make you an admiral of the Seuss Navy. And we have two different certificates. They're very difficult to find as well. And this is a certificate given to somebody um, that became a, an admiral. And what I really like, not only the illustrations around the edge, but you notice the seal stuck on the document, the orange seal. So it's a seal of a seal on the document. So that's the same nuzzle plus the guy that's in the center of the ashtray. I think it's really a cute little way to do that. Illustrations are fantastic. As you can see, it's all has to do with nautical type things and what have you. And this is somebody at SO that would have been dressed up in his Seuss Navy Admiralty outfit. That's a real photograph we have. Now, one of my favorite things are some of the advertisements he did for them. This is a puzzle that came in this brown paper bag and uh, it was for SO lubrication products, as you can see in the puzzle in the top uh, right corner. So you've got this family, happy family driving their car and all these creatures, all these Seuss creatures coming out and uh, doing whatever, taking, um, um, you know, like a crankshaft, uh, a crank from the crankshaft that uh, you see in the top, uh, the green monster there. And it says, foiled by Esolu, a five-star theater. So these were things that would have damaged your car, the types of things that would be coming after you, that Esso would help you to alleviate. And what I really like is on the back side of the bag that the unassembled uh, puzzle came in, they tell you uh, all the, uh, what all the um, characters are. So you got Carbo Noctis. So that's a knocking carburetor. Modo munch, Munches, Munches. Uh, it's all the different things that could happen to your car. And of course, what do they actually show you? 
is the motorist, his wife, and child. They, they actually explain that to you as well and give a little blurb about, about that. But you, you can imagine pulling into the gas station, your family getting this great little puzzle. It's a nice size. Now, these are three original ads that we have in the collection from the New York Times. These are, you know, how big the Times is, or it was back then. These are full page color ads for Esso lubrication products, all done by Seuss. And the one in the middle, if you look at the bottom, they're advertising the Marx Brothers. So we even have a little bit of a uh, uh, Judaica associated with that. You know, Dr. Seuss was not Jewish, but uh, as you'll see in some of the later things, uh, very, very concerned about what was happening to the Jewish people during the Holocaust. So this is the centerfold and it's too big for my scanner. It's from Yachting Magazine and it's a giant two page spread. And it says, welcome to Esso uh, Marine <laughs> Marinia. And uh, it's a beautiful uh, color illustration. And this, these books are really heavy. It's like the old Esquire magazines, very big, very large and heavy, thick um, uh, publications. And this is what people would see um, that were in the boating industry, both dealers as well as uh, other people. One of the things I might point out, um, if you notice in the dead center there, there's a man uh, that I guess it represents a, uh, um, a, a black person. It's, I don't think it's somebody in black face, but this is how cartoonists uh, depicted people of color back in those days. And, uh, you know, I, you can't help but say it's, it's not racist, but it was never meant that he was never a racist person, but it was the way things were depicted, right or wrong, it's, um, it, it's what it was. Now, this is something I want you to pay attention to this picture from, I think, 1939. And this is at the Hotel Astor. And this is January of 39. So nine months later, almost to the day, two weeks shy, that World War II will break out. The Nazis will invade Poland in the official start of World War II. And here's what's going on in America. SO Marine Products dealers are all together in New York, the whole big shebang of them. And notice what they're all wearing, these funny caps. And we happen to have one of those caps in our collection. And that's, it's an admiral in the Seuss Navy hat. Notice the big marine type, uh, mariners type bill on, on, the, uh, uh, on the hat. And I've only seen three of these and I lost the first two on auctions. And I said to myself, I don't care what I pay, I'm not losing it a third time because chances are I'll never even see it again. So we snagged one of those and I just love it. It's uh, how it survived because that bill, you can see it's kind of cardboardy sort of material, but it's a real doozy. And it's got that same little Admiral, um, pardon me, Seuss Navy fish, the fish bones, if you will, that you saw in the glass as well. Now, we had owned at one time these original uh, Seuss pictures and the third one you'll see in a minute. I sold these off. We really weren't using them for display. But um, these were done um, for FLIT. So Esso had a product called FLIT, F-L-I-T. And it was basically D DDT in a pump spray can. If you remember in the Godfather movie when Marlon Brando dies in the tomato patch with his grandson and the kids running around spraying that, that that's a flit container. And uh, it, that, that's probably what killed Marlon Brando in that scene. Uh, anyway, be that as it may, um, these were original artwork that were submitted um, and ran somewhere, I don't know what publication, uh, for the flit advertisement. And with the three originals that I purchased, I bought these from this Mr. Jackson, you can see his letter, um, was addressed to Mr. Jackson, signed by Dr. Seuss, 1981. Um, his daughter sold these. I bought them direct from her. And basically, he talks about where he thinks they came from and when he thinks they were done. So he says between 34 and 39, which is the period. And uh, he thinks they were from the collection of the guy that was the advertising executive that handled the um, FLIT account at Esso, he worked for um, McCann Erickson Advertising. So kind of interesting stuff. I saw the letter with the, and this was the color one that came with it. And this one you can uh, you see more clearly the flip can and what that was, if anybody remembers those. 
So he did a lot of interesting things that people don't know about. Back in the day, you can see this is World War II era, October of 1941, it's dated. And this is an ad for General Electra. They were General Electric Corporation, they're light bulbs. And it's just a cute little quizzical ad um, that he was paid probably a lot of money to do called uh, Look at the Serious Side of Bulb Snatching. So I'm not sure what bulb snatching is, but I guess if you read that, you could find out more about it. This is uh, when he starts getting into this wartime period. You see now tanks and other military things coming into play here. And this says uh, that was the, the famous tagline with all his flip products, uh, Quick Henry the Flip. And I want you to notice that mosquito. That is going to come into play very, very important during World War II, the America's entry into World War II. And we all know the book, or most of us should know the book, or do know the book, Yertle the Turtle and Other Stories by Dr. Seuss. And this is one of those turtles that you saw very early on. Um, in, in one of the, um, uh, in the very first Judge Magazine cover from the 1930s. Now here it is again, you notice the V. And the V during World War II was for victory. You know, Winston Churchill holding up his hands like that. Everything was V. And if you ever notice the dot, 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 dash next to a V, that's Morris code for the letter V. And uh, many movies and other things, you'll see that. So a lot of people don't know what that means, but that's it. And it says you can't build a substantial V out of turtles. And uh, so he used the Yurt of the Turtles that was molded um, on the theme of Hitler being the giant turtle taking over all the little turtles in the pond one after the other. Um, and here it is using those same turtles uh, in an advertisement, uh, uh, you know, for producing products and high production for US plants and what have you. Now, this is a very hard to find cover from PM Daily Magazine, the newspaper. And it shows an appeaser, an isolationist, if you will, in the center handing out lollipops to the uh, Nazi uh, perpetrators that were attacking all over Europe, whether it was the Anschluss, you know, taking over Austria or in, uh, in, into the uh, Sudetenland and, and Czechoslovakia and, and so on, uh, one thing after another. And the guy in the middle represents Chamberlain and Charles Lindbergh and Father Coughlin, the Catholic priest up in, uh, in Michigan, all the isolationists, Henry Ford and so on. So uh, it's a very, very poignant illustration in color on a, um, on, on a newspaper. Now, this is a cartoon he ran also in, uh, in PM Daily. And it says, it's, it's a little ditty, right? Said a bird in the midst of a blitz. Up to now, they've scored very few hits. So I'll sit on my canny, my old star spangled fanny. And on it, he sits and he sits. So while the blitz is going on and the uh, Nazis are trying to um, take, you know, the, the air raids and so on, the bombing of London, the United States is just sitting by the isolationist and uh, um, this is kind of showing uh, maybe it's not such a good idea. And then he runs this one uh, just around the same time. What are you chasing most pal, butterflies or skunks? So the anti-access, the access are obviously the Italians, the Nazis and the Germans and the Japanese. So he's hunting with a gun but he's showing that what he's really doing is going after selfish pleasures uh, with a butterfly net. And he's saying too many of us are these isolationists. People were very concerned. And this is from 1942, I believe it says in the bottom from field publications. And he's saying that the sentiment in America was basically stay out of the war after, the, uh, um, after what happened in World War I. Um, and the problems in America economically, the loss of life and the amount of money we spent, uh, people really weren't interested in engaging again in a European conflict. However, please notice the date on this advertisement run on December 7th of 1941. He never knew what hit him. December 7th, Pearl Harbor. Boom, war, blow up the isolationists. So people like Senators Nye and Wheeler 
Lindbergh and all these people, all of a sudden, everything, the America First Committee, it was all shut down. Guys like Charles Coughlin, the priest up in uh, Michigan, he actually, they put, went after him with the Sedition Act to shut him down. So this is another original drawing that we still own uh, from our collection. It's very large and um, it's really quite telling. So this is uh, Arthur Schick, uh, Arthur Schick, Dr. Seuss giving an idea of Hitler painting what he's selling everybody. The complete propaganda hocus pocus story. Germania with the Hitler cherubs on top. Truth, peace, labor, law, plenty. Everything that they're not. And if, you, if for some of you don't know, or you may recognize, that's John Kudhe in the bottom. And he was an American ambassador um, to a, a number of countries as uh, the Nazis took countries from Poland and so on. He went to the uh, low countries in, in, in the West. Um, he eventually came back and ran unsuccessfully for Congress in New York, but he's selling uh, John Kudhe a, um, a, a bill of goods and that's what this represents. This painting actually appears in the book, Dr. Seuss Goes to War. That's quite something if you're interested, take a look at. I forgot what page it's on, but that's how important this drawing is. And we own this original artwork. So um, what went on during the period people sent mail, uh, the United States issued a series of stamps called the um, uh, over, I think they were overrun countries. And uh, you can see this is one of them, Belgium, uh, one of the low countries. And it's a first day of issue stamp in 1943. It was sent to uh, uh, Sam uh, Zalvetsky um, in Wilkinsburg, PA. But look at the cachet in stamp collecting when you have a, uh, uh, some sort of image uh, illustration on the uh, actual envelope, it's called the cachet. And here's one from 1943 that shows the uh, actual painting that we own. And what's really nice about it, you see the same thing in the book, Dr. Seuss Goes to War. It says, there you are, Johnny, his name was John Coudet, uh, sell that to the suckers in the USA. So uh, although it's peeled off the original artwork, now you can see what, what, um, what Hitler was basically saying there. And uh, here's another one. I love talking about this guy, Coughlin. He was a real SOB, uh, much like a lot of the, uh, a lot of the um, uh, um, um, Catholic infrastructure in Europe, especially the Vatican during this time. But he says, uh, not bad, Coughlin. This is Hitler talking to uh, Coughlin, who had a paper called Social Justice, anti-Semitic rag. He says, but when are you going to start printing it in German? So again, just to play on uh, these people, this is a Luxembourg overrun country stamp. So somebody produced a lot of these. Anybody familiar, uh, you don't have to answer a rhetorical question, Trees by Joyce Kilmer. It's one of the most beautiful poems I've ever, ever heard. Um, it's, I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree, a tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast, a tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray. Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. This is cut from an original copy of PM Daily. It's not the original artwork. It is original from the newspaper. That's Hitler and Pierre Laval. Laval was the head along with uh, Marshal Patton of the Vichy government, the pro-Nazi collaborationist government in France. And so Dr. Seuss comes out with this, only God can make a tree, a parody on the poem, to furnish sport for you and me. And you'll notice here that these guys find the trees are very useful for uh, hanging Jews, uh, not anything to do with the uh, environment or the sheer beauty of nature. I think it's a quite a telling uh, um, cartoon that he did, political cartoon. And you'll notice that uh, our friend Adolf there has another uh, rope with a noose getting ready to find another victim. So. I found that one, Only God Can Make a Tree. And uh, somebody reproduced that onto one of these covers, Overrun Nations, this is Albania. 
By the way, just for those of you who don't know, Albania, although they only had a few hundred Jews living there, they protected, uh, to my knowledge, all of their Jewish people, it's a Muslim country, um, during World War II. Um, thousands of other Jews from uh, Western Europe, um, more, more mainly from Western Europe, people from uh, Poland and so on, they were kind of locked in very early between the Nazis and the Soviets. Um, they, uh, they, they, they met uh, a, a little different fate. They tried to uh, protect many of them, but uh, uh, when the Nazis occupied the uh, Balkan area, um, that was pretty much it for them. Uh, here's another good cartoon he did for PM. Uh, they're serving roast Adolf at Joe's house tonight. You can see him with, a, instead of a fork and a spoon, he's got a hammer and a sickle. And, um, you know, Hitler with a, uh, as a pig, that was pretty common denoting Hitler as a pig. And this is from December 24th of, uh, of 1941. Here's another one, a new pet from the sewers of Paris. Uh, Dero was a, uh, a pro-Nazi pro collaborator and uh, he's pulling him out of the sewers of Paris, another SOB. And again, you can see this, this is an Austria overrun country. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know, occupied nation. Uh, to me, the Austrians were so happy to become part and collaborate with the Nazis. I'm not sure I would have put that in that particular uh, series of stamps. Anyway, uh, we have some interesting stuff. I found these images because they're nice, uh, crystal clear, but uh, the ones we have aren't, aren't quite this nice. Um, it's really cute. This is uh, Tojo, the Japanese uh, collaborator, if you will, reading Mein Kampf, My Struggle from Adolf Hitler. And the painting in the back says, your old pal Adolf. And he says, now what in the blazes am I going to use for Jews? And I just love the one on the right. These caricatures are just off the wall. This is from 1942. The married exactly one year today after they signed the agreement and it's Hashimura Frankenstein. I mean, that's, that's the result of that marriage. It's uh, uh, very racist, but you have to understand what was going on uh, in the world at that period and uh, uh, pretty, pretty tough stuff. And I found these on a couple of mailed envelopes. Uh, one is from uh, San Luis Obispo in California. It's soldier's mail, it's military mail. It's called Free Franken, didn't require a stamp. And the other one's a little bit later after the war from Minnesota uh, in 1946. These things were still floating around. And this is another one. He says, I don't like to brag boys, but when I bit Colonel, but when I bit Colonel McCormick, it established the greatest all time itch on record. And it says the anti Roosevelt bug. And um, McCormick, is the guy, Colonel McCormick, that ran the Chicago Tribune. And he, like Lindbergh, were big America First Committee guys, huge um, anti-Semites both, and uh, they both um, uh, wanted the US uh, out, of, out of the war. And uh, this is one uh, just calling out McCormick as uh, many people did. I threw this one in here um, it was just interesting. I never did buy this letter, but I, I was able to get a copy of it. It just talks a little bit about, it's 1975, earlier than the other one we saw, but it talks about how much money he was getting or what his drawings were worth in 19, $175. <laughs> the ones we have go for thousands of dollars. Um, and I mean thousands, um, and uh, look at just uh, not that many years ago, um, what his stuff was selling for. So it became more and more popular as time went on. Now, as we um, talked about the mosquito, this is now when Dr. Seuss, Theodore Geisel is working for the War Department. And his name was not allowed to be uh, appear on the, on the illustrations. I mean, it's, it's documented and all known that it's his, but this is a giant poster. We've had these on display at the, uh, um, the National War of the Pacific in Fredericksburg, Texas, um, when we had a very, very large exhibit there um, on World War II cartoonists. Uh, it was just, just our material for that um, exhibit. And uh, this is what's called a news map. And it's probably about two foot by four foot, the map itself. And on the back side, is this Dr. Seuss illustration of the world where malaria is 
And uh, Anne is the name that he gave to the mosquito. And it says, this is Anne, she drinks blood. And the little booklet, that's a very rare booklet called This is Anne is fully illustrated, very simple uh, booklet put out by the War Department, all about malaria, um, what it causes, how to avoid it, and so on. It's uh, really very unique stuff and, and very poignant. So I want to talk about war bonds for a minute. When Dr. Seuss was a Boy Scout, they had a, um, uh, bonds became very important to him. But, you know, Dr. Seuss never made uh, or very seldom made public, uh, public appearances for a guy that was, had that much notoriety throughout his life. You very seldom ever saw him anywhere or heard from him uh, other than in his publications. And when he was a Boy Scout in, in Springfield, uh, Massachusetts, he went out and his grandfather, the brewer, bought a huge number of, of war bonds from him. Now, this is World War I war bonds. And um, he was one of the top 10 re uh, recipients of an award. And at that time, former President Teddy Roosevelt was invited in for a big, a big ceremony um, uh, to uh, award these kids, the top 10 people, um, uh, in some kind of plaque or award. Well, I don't know what happened. Nobody seems to know. I've done some research on it. There were nine awards and he was the 10th kid there and he didn't get one. And, uh, you know, Roosevelt looked at him, I guess the way the story goes, like, what's he doing here? And uh, just looked at him and then walked off. Roosevelt left and it really impacted Dr. Seuss as a kid very, very negatively but he kept the theme of doing the war bond. So in Britain during the war, they had a thing called the squander bug and he developed his own squander bug, uh, eating money and just wasting money by war bonds. This is a very rare poster we have in our collection, been on exhibit a number of times. And these are more things where you see recurring his squander bug figure, even though it's green on the top left, this was a Woman's War Finance Committee booklet. You can see it's stapled there. And the, the thing below it is um, a, another illustration of the squander bug in that. The one, the red one on the top right ran in PM Daily Magazine uh, newspaper. And uh, I forgot where this uh, fold out is. I, it's either a paper or a magazine we have, but I don't recall which one it was. But you see the squander bug in there as well. Very widely utilized. And um, these were the kinds of things that showed up. I blew them up for you, but the white and black, the black and white ones there wiped the sneer off the face, Tojo and Hitler. Those ran as like two inch by two inch um, or smaller little inserts in all kinds of off the wall magazines. They were everywhere to get people to buy war bonds. Now the one on the bottom is quite a large banner poster. It's quite large. And this is something that would have hung in a, uh, perhaps a school or a, um, uh, some sort of industrial facility during the war to encourage people to buy more war bonds. This is some really rare stuff, these posters. So now um, let's go through and talk about a little bit more while he's uh, uh, working for the War Department. So Private Snafu, you already know what that is. When you listen to Private Snafu, um, they're not written by, uh, pardon me, the voice is not Dr. Seuss. I think actually that might be Mel Blank uh, um, that has done a lot of the private snafu voiceover, but Dr. Seuss did a lot of the writing of the script. So if you go Google private snafu and watch some of the real, these were World War II training films put out by the War Services Department, um, the War Department's uh, special services group for showing um, you know, you had kids, right, by the, by the hundreds of thousands every week and year um, going through basic training. And it was all about how to use explosives and doing normal things, making a cartoon so these young teenage kids would pay attention as they're in the army. But now this was a little bit different. Your job in Germany was released by the War Department probably... Um, I don't know, maybe a month or so before VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. Uh, the war was all but over. The, 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 the uh, Soviets were about ready to um, you, you know, hammer Berlin and uh, 
uh, most of Germany had, had been um, uh, overrun at this point. I guess my dad had already been right through Germany and was already hit, uh, was still fighting in Czechoslovakia when the war came to an end. And uh, this was a really, really anti-German film about people, about American troops during the upcoming occupation of Germany and how not to trust the German people, that basically it was really true, as anti-German as it may be, that they, as my dad once said, and I remember taking him to his 50th reunion of the 8th Armored Division, all the guys that were there, my gosh, it was, they said there was no such thing, that everyone was a Nazi. And uh, it, it was really horrific, uh, I guess the lion's share of the people. But this was an anti-German film for occupation troops or soon to be occupation troops, warning them that these people are not to be trusted. It's a really, really serious film. And uh, the next one was Designed for Death. And there was another film. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. The most important thing about your job in Germany is that Dr. Seuss and his wife, Helen, were the screenwriters for this. So um, that's very, very important, the kinds of things that he was doing, not just cartoons. And this one uh, also uh, screen wrote, and I'll show you some, I think I have some close-ups uh, coming up on this. This, this got released as Design for Death after the war during the occupation of Japan. But this was, um, oh, geez, let me see if I have it. Uh, this also written for the screen by both of them. But this was actually uh, taken from a, from a War Department movie called um, uh, Our, Our Job in Japan. And uh, so this Design for Death became a, another film just focusing on how the Japanese um, their whole culture evol evolved around death, destruction, and war, and training their kids from early, very early ages. And it goes through the different elements of Japanese uh, history, uh, showing one to the other to the other, um, leading up to uh, World War II. And I will tell you that this stuff um, really was true when I lectured at the uh, Unit 731 uh, Japanese Criminal Evidence Museum in Harbin, China, when I was there on a Holocaust lecture, and you saw what the Japanese did, the biological and uh, chemical warfare experiments against the Chinese civilians, and the rape, and what they did all throughout Asia. Um, this was a film that really called it out for exactly what it was. And once again, this is written for the screen by Theodore and his first wife, Helen Geisel. So, kind of winding down a little bit and taking some, of maybe uh, cooling it off a bit. Um, this was something in 1956. So he, he moved uh, years earlier to uh, La Jolla, California, just south of uh, San Diego. And um, that's where he lived and produced. And as a matter of fact, the University of Southern California um, has uh, all of his, uh, most of his papers. A lot of the ESSO stuff is here uh, in Austin um, at, at, at one of the uh, libraries at the University of Texas, and of course here with me, but, uh, and Michelle. So uh, this is a booklet he did, Signs of Civilization. The La Jolla Town Council asked him to illustrate something to, they didn't want um, big billboards going up and ruining their landscape and their beautiful little, uh, very wealthy community. And that's what this is about. So towards the end of his career, when he wasn't doing the kids' books, um, this is the kind of stuff he was producing. And I assume he, he did this for his own uh, community, uh, most likely pro bono. But it's a cute little thing. And I wasn't, uh, this is just some of the uh, pages. I thought it's uh, some of his more modern stuff. It's kind of cute. And uh, this was, uh, I, unfortunately, the guy wouldn't sell this to me that I bought the booklet from. But this is the actual uh, clipping from the newspaper in La Jolla that talked about the, the booklet that he had produced for them. So that's kind of fun, too. That would have been a nice piece to have in the collection. So, um, you know, we saw a lot of things here. And I thought because this is a, a Jewish group, I thought you'll notice my beautiful wife, Michelle, holding her Dr. Seuss bag. Um, these were some posters that you can, if you look closely, you'll see uh, our Dr. Seuss themes uh, where we were exhibiting. Uh, somewhere. And that's the shirt that uh, my lovely wife has, one fish, two fish, red fish, gefilte fish. 
And uh, I'm not sure that's what Dr. Seuss had in mind, but uh, um, uh, my wife loves her gefilte fish jokes. And this is something really, really important. Are some of you familiar with the Art Spiegelman? He did a series of, um, of comics um, called Mouse. And they were originally published uh, almost monthly as, as chapters. They were uh, graphic, graphic novels, people call it, but it's like a comic book style, right? And um, they were published in, in um, about these mice. It's all Holocaust related. And that's who Art Spiegelman is. And it was eventually produced in two volumes um, in, into actually publications. And I, I only have like two, they're almost impossible to find of the actual magazines with the um, chapter by chapter in there. But I really like to read this. I know it's a lot of text, but this is what Art Spiegelman had to say in the American cartoonist, one of their magazines about Dr. Seuss. The, and it's talking about Dr. Seuss's cartoons. These cartoons rail against isolationism, racism, anti-Semitism, with a conviction and fervor lacking in most other American editorial pages of the period. These are virtually the only editorial cartoons outside the communist and black press that decried the military's Jim Crow policies and Charles, Lim Charles Lindbergh's anti-Semitism and many others, I'll add. Dr. Seuss said that he had no great cause or interest in social issues until Hitler and explained that PM, the daily newspaper, was against people who pushed other people around. I like that. More of a humanist than an ideologue, one of those Groucho rather than Karl Marxists, Dr. Seuss made these drawings with the fire of honest indignation and anger that fuels all real political art. If they have a flaw, it's an absolutely endearing one. They're funny. And I think that sums up, that uh, pretty much sums up what uh, Dr. Seuss did during that period. Um, I always uh, like what my wife tells me to do, and she says, this is the best thing you could end with. with. Don't cry because it's over. Smile that it happened. And that's a famous quote by Dr. Seuss. And today you are you that is truer than true. There is no one alive that is youer than you. So I thank you all for your very kind attention. Um, we have some other slides if you're interested. The Butter Battle book, which was a um, uh, Cold War political book that he wrote. And uh, we can talk and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and open it up to questions or comments. And uh, I hope I didn't take uh, over my allotted time here. So I guess we could maybe have um, questions like maybe turn off their mics, I think, rather than doing the chats. So let me go to a gallery view where I could see everybody. We have, uh, I can see almost everybody here. And Phyllis, did you like the presentation? I loved it. Yeah, but did, see, you're biased. You love everything I do. You always did. Um, I love all what you do is you you paint a, a picture oh. and brings history that brings history how are, how are uh, and makes it meaningful to me as a Jew and as a human being, uh, and <laughs> introduces things that I had never thought of. Well, so great, I good. Really appreciate it. So, Spike, do we have any questions, or are we done for the evening? Oh, okay, Nora. Hi there. I got a, yeah, I've got a question. Um, the, the book, uh, Dr. Seuss Goes to War, is that available? Oh, sure. You can pick that up on, uh, oh, almost anywhere. Eight books, eBay. Um, it, it was mass produced. I've got, there's actually two different ones. There's Dr. Seuss Goes to War, which was the first one. And you'll see those, uh, some of those illustrations in there. The other one is Dr. Seuss and Company Go to War. And that one is uh, nice. That shows a lot of different political cartoonists, including Arthur Schick in that one. <laughs> but the Dr. Seuss Ghost Tour was the first, and that, that focus is just on him. It's a fascinating book. It's, a, it's um, uh, hold on just a moment. There's a book that I recommend because I, I like biographies. That's my favorite kind of thing to read. And there's one called um, Becoming Dr. Seuss, Theodore Giesel and the Making of an American Imagination. It's a pretty new yeah, book. That, you can get it free from the library. 
And the author is uh, Brian J. Jones. And he also did a biography of um, George Lucas that's really good and a biography of uh, Jim Henson. So he likes to do art. Yeah, I, I, it's gonna, the whole thing's gonna, it's gonna slide over. But that's why I didn't take it out. I'm happy to discuss those if anybody wants to read them. I enjoyed them a lot. Heck, I read the Dr. Seuss book twice because I, I wanted to make sure I learned a lot. Oh, I thought it was because you were slow. Yeah, that's probably what it. What were you going to say about that? Oh, yeah. What were you going to say about the, what were you going to like give you. an answer for Nora, Greg, that you, when you walked away? And then I, I just uh, filled uh, I went to go, but I'm, I have so many books on my desk. I'm afraid if I pull one out, it's going to all fall over. But Nora, that's what okay. was the rest yeah. of your question? Yeah, I'll be happy to look for it. What, did you have another question that I missed? No, no, okay. I didn't. Greg, is your collection only <clears throat> Dr. Zeus? Or do you <clears throat> collect other uh, artwork of that period and uh, of the war. Yeah, Jim, we actually have quite an extensive collection. So um, we probably have uh, private collections anymore. Our Arthur Schick collection is quite extensive and, and we can exhibit Schick or uh, Seuss, guys like that in, in museums and libraries and so on. We have so much material, but we collect many other artists, some Jews, some, some Jewish folks, some not. Um, among the Jewish ones are Dave Brieger. Uh, he did a private Brieger during the war. Um, he was the one that coined the phrase GI, uh, a, a GI for government issue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dave Brieger was one. Milton Canna from Dayton, Ohio. Um, uh, he, he had Terry and the Pirates, if you remember these comic strips, Steve oh, yeah. Canyon, a uh, huge uh, cartoonist during the war. Walt Disney, we again, not Jewish, but we have a huge Walt Disney um, uh, a collection for his World War II uh, era material. Um, who else? And, and there's others. Uh, Reg Manning, a, a Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, Bill Malden, po two Pulitzer Prize, youngest guy to ever win it for his um, uh, mail call and Terry and the Pirates. Uh, so we, we have a huge collection of World War II political artists, and we also have battlefield artists, not just the political cartoonists, people that were out doing artwork in the, in the action, documenting it through paintings. Uh, a lot of it, a, a lot of it ran in, um, um, geez, um, Abbott Labs had a magazine, a uh, pharmaceutical magazine during the war. And every issue, they would feature one of these combat artists. And we have quite a collection of those. And it's absolutely magnificent stuff. And some of the guys were Jewish that did that, too. That's George Schreiber, who's my uncle. And Thomas Hart Benton, his buddy. Oh, I have some stuff by Benton, some of his World War II stuff. It, it's incredible artwork by all these guys. And it played a really serious role in helping to document and bring to light what was happening around the globe during the war. Oh, that's great. Good to hear. My, my, father, yeah. my father was in World War II and he was in ammunition and camouflage. And he did a number of watercolors all throughout England. And many a letter he sent home, he would draw on the envelope some of them were censored uh you know but uh there was he was called in to uh, a general's uh, tent one time to uh ask to commission to paint a portrait of roosevelt because all the great generals and they were having this big meeting and no one had any pictures of of the president there roosevelt <laughs> so no, he, he just turned he, himself around he, op he opened up uh, some british house paint and let it uh, evaporate for about two weeks so it would thicken up enough so that he could paint on the right. boards of the Jeeps that were transported over. He made a canvas out of the boards wow. and you know, painted it. They had the meeting, he kissed it goodbye. And about a year after he came back to the States, a year and a half, he got a registered letter. My mother got a registered letter at home and said there was a 65 pound package at waiting for him at the post oh, office, my, my mom thought, boy, she must have been some type of skinny British woman, you know, that they would have shipped over because my dad had made friends there. <laughs> and, 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 you know, so they picked it up and here's the oil painting. And it was- a Do you have it? Oh yeah, yeah, my sister- Oh, that's has. fantastic, wow. Yeah. 
Yeah, and he has it because this captain who really liked my dad um, uh, got it shipped over. There was a sergeant who was anti-Semitic mm. and he was on my dad's butt all the time. And uh, there mm. was a lot of good people and bad people, but it was just very interesting. So sometime maybe I'll email you some of the uh, photographs of his work. Since yeah, I'd love, I'd love to see it actually. Spike has all my contact information. Okay, so. good, good. So, yeah, good. thanks for sharing that. Oh, you're uh, other thank questions? You. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank Did you have more? Oh, no, no. But thank oh, okay. thank sorry, you. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, no. Have you read the uh, articles on the Dorado submarine? That's what Schreiber and Benton were on. No, I, I don't recall that. No. Google uh, Schreiber Dorado. I'll take and a you'll look. You'll find the uh, boat number on the submarine in your paintings is wrong. And you'll find out why. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, let's see who else had. Somebody had a question. Uh, was Walker, that Walker? Go ahead, Walker. Go ahead, Walker. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the story of Albania and the preservation of the Jewish population in the war in a Muslim country, <laughs> but um, the explanation would be that. Islamic countries used to have and theoretically still have the practice that if you pay a special tax, they give you, quote, dimmy status, end quote, and they leave you alone as long as you pay the tax. Since the foundation of Israel, that's all sort of gone by the boards. But Hannah Arendt wrote in, uh, I think it was in the Eichmann book, the Eichmann stories, that um, a similar thing happened in Bulgaria because the Orthodox, uh, Eastern Orthodox Bishop of Bulgaria said, quote, the Jews have their own special covenant with God and we should leave them alone, end quote. And so more Jews proportionately survived in Bulgaria than in any other European Christian country. Yeah, I think I'd be real careful with some of the, with that, with that, the analysis there in a couple of levels. Number one, uh, in Bulgaria, the Jews were slaughtered, and there, there just weren't as many. There, there wasn't some huge population like you would find in Poland. Right. But I think it's very important if if you wanted to focus on that subject about what happened with Muslims in Europe. Um, are you familiar with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, a guy named Al Husseini, an uncle or a cousin to Yasser Arafat? Yeah. He went to Hitler, and you should read about that. And uh, he went and created the only non Aryan SS division. He met personally, there's documentation, photographs of him with Hitler. And he wanted, he hated Jews, he wanted the Jews out of Palestine, he wanted the British out of Palestine. And if you look at, it's called the Hanshar division. Hanshar is a, um, a Muslim ceremonial sword. They were Bosnian Muslims. And they, they had officers that were Nazis, uh, German Nazis. And uh, uh, they went through the Balkans and ravaged the Jewish population there like nothing, like, like complete wild animals, like the Ukrainians did in 1920 under Petlura, the head of the Ukrainian army, when they massacred and butchered 100,000 Jews. These people were the most vicious uh, animals that you could imagine, like their Nazi counterparts from, and collaborators from all over. So when I hear about anything in Bulgaria and uh, Albania and so on, trust me, that there was no one, almost no one, I should say, looking out for any Jewish people. So if you, you want to really read history, go read about the Hanshar division. I've got a whole collection on it. And it's a very powerful, 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 tragic story for the Jewish people. Other questions? Wow, OK. I do, I do have to add that. Anybody um... enjoy the presentation, comments? Very good. Everyone's uh, muted, so. so okay. Well, you could unmute. It's okay. We're all we're Very all good. friends. Very good. Very Thank good. you. I love Thank it. Thank you so much.